Hello, Timmy Nafso here with the Embedded Podcast at Fortis. We are filming from Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay at the Electronic Transaction Association. Enjoy the series as we interview thought leaders about all things payments, the past, the present, and the future. Welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Timmy Nafso here at ETA. I have with me Peter. Peter, welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Peter is a serial entrepreneur with sales and business development expertise. Peter was on the founding team that built Empire, one of the first card-linked offer platforms acquired by Chase. In addition, Peter founded the world's first ever Facebook credits loyalty program, Plink. Most recently, Peter co-founded LeafWire, the LinkedIn of cannabis, which quickly grew to become the largest business network in cannabis. Peter has been a thought leader across several industries and has been published in TechCrunch, VentureBeat, and Entrepreneur.com, amongst others, in addition to speaking at numerous conferences across the globe. Final thought, Peter is also 12.5% Canadian, quite a level of entrepreneurship expertise, but I do want to start with the final comment I made there of 12.5% Canadian. I've spent a lot of time in Canada, being that I'm in, based out of Detroit, and we run over to Windsor because you only needed to be 19 to, to drink and gamble at the Caesars Casino I've, there. Um, at the I've done time. the same thing. I, I grew up in Northeast Ohio, so we weren't too okay. far. <laughs> nice, nice. So 12.5% Canadian, how does that happen? Well, so I, I did Ancestry.com, as you know, a lot of us do, to learn about our, you know, our past and our, our people, uh, and found out that my grandmother's dad had actually come down from Canada into Maine. So my, my, my grandmother's dad would have been 100%, making my grandmother 50, making my mom 25. Therefore, naturally, I'm 12.5%. That's a and, lot. Uh, That's at, a at lot one, of math. Yeah. It is. And at one point, I put that on my Twitter description. And of everything else about myself that I thought was so interesting, the only thing anyone ever asked about was that. That is awesome. So, that is awesome. Well, there's certainly a kindness about you that I've already met, and that must be the 12 and a half percent Canadian. It's got to be. They are, they're, they're damn nice people, <laughs> yeah, that's for are. sure. They're great. They're great. We've enjoyed time there. So, um, All right. So we're going to get into a little bit about you know you and how you got into the payment space. I mentioned a lot of your, your experience. Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of different angles than my upbringing in the payment space. Mm -hmm. so I've sold payments early on, early 2000s, just as a sales rep door to door. Um, and then we shifted into really focusing on the ISO market and sales reps and things like that. You took a much different approach to payments. If you could tell us a little bit about that and your history. Sure. So my approach was less from really the, the technical payments angle from more from the where payments intersects with marketing and loyalty. Yes. So one of the first fintech companies that, that I was a founder of was, was Plink, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. which was a Facebook credits loyalty program, which for everyone out there who remembers Farmville and all the crazy social gaming days, uh, we saw that and we saw this audience of people who was so entranced by social gaming uh, that we thought, hey, let's make a loyalty program and let's base it on the, the currency of the game on Facebook, which at the time was Facebook credits. Yes. Um, and that was hugely popular for a period of time. Unfortunately, Facebook canceled Facebook credits completely, which really hurt the company. Uh, but before that happened, we had actually signed on and gotten companies like Taco Bell and 7-Eleven and Burger King and The Gap, uh, awesome. all to essentially pay us a percentage of all the money our members were spending in their stores. So you would register a card with kind of a plaid-like service where people are entering their bank credentials and then we could track all their all their purchasing across everywhere uh, and so that we could go to Taco Bell and say hey uh, you can do a deal with us pay us seven percent of what our members spend in your stores uh, and we can prove a lot of it's incremental uh, and they loved it it was performance based and it was tied to the social gaming audience which was you know at the time was massive and hugely influential oh yeah and I think it, it continues to, to, to thrive. Now, is this kind of your entry into what became this loyalty passion for? It, it, it is more uh, the entry into the kind of the, the concurrence of, or the confluence of payments and loyalty. Got it. 
Uh, in the, the late 90s, around 2000, I, I helped start an online points program, uh, but that was all online. Back then, you, it was hard to track offline. Yeah. There, there weren't all these services that we have now. Um, and back then, it was getting people to sign up for a Discover card. And we would you know, pay a member you know, a points equivalent to 30, 40 bucks. And Discover card was pay us you know, 80 bucks for someone to sign up. But back then, I mean, we were getting people to sign up for AOL you know, with the free discs. Yeah, we know uh, AOL. B yeah. B BM BMG Music Service. If yes, you remember. I got in trouble um, with that. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I signed up my 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 cat and I think my younger sister. Uh, it, yeah, I think we all did. We did. We all and and then and then you forget to return like the one tape or two, and all of a sudden you owe like fifty dollars. Exactly right. Uh, but yeah, I so we we promoted all those old school companies. Most of them nice. are barely around anymore. Um, and but that was all online and all marketing. Yes. The, the payments angle really started more when we started tracking credit cards. Absolutely. So today, what is it that uh, V Loyalty does, and how does it work? Yeah. Uh, so it, it's kind of almost come full circle in the sense that now I'm combining the shopping offline and tracking via credit card. So what, what's so so we operate loyalty programs for companies. One of the largest ones we operate is for Napa Auto Parts. Yeah. Uh, and they have, you know, five thousand plus stores, fifteen million plus members. Uh, we operate the programs in the US and Canada. And one of the things that's unique about us, or our value prop, is that we have five patents. One of them is around inserting a card into the terminal. And when you insert the card, we create a token. We save the token to the cloud. And then every time a member comes back and pays with the card, they are automatically tracked. So, so they never have to tell the merchant, hey, I'm in the program. What's your phone number? Here's my mobile app. It's all seamless. It's all automated. And that's why you know, we call it embedded loyalty because yes. it's all in the it's in the process. Every time you pay, you never have to go outside the process. When you join, we ask right in the terminal, hey, it looks like we don't recognize this credit card. Would you like to start earning rewards? You say yes, enter your phone number one time. We tie that phone number to the token. And from that point on, you're a member of the loyalty program. Amazing. And then every time you come back, we track automated. We give rewards automated. And we also send mobile messages to tell people every single time, you just got this, you got points, you got $5 off, you got a reward, et cetera. So everything's automated. The, the counter person and the member, neither one has to do anything. So Amazing. it's all literally as embedded in the process of the payment as you can get. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because frictionless payments became a really big thing as are all frictionless experiences. If we want to go back in time, let's talk about the history of loyalty. We went back to punch cards, right? right. Like that was kind of how it was. And by the way, there were companies as recent as five years ago that I experienced punch card loyalty. And you're like, how are they still doing this? Yep. And how are they managing it? But how is the fraud not being avoided as well? We know that the consumer as well are trying to stay away from more clicks, more interactions, more cards, so on and so forth. Going back in time, 2015, 2016, five years ago, how has that evolved as you've seen what was versus what is today? Uh, I, I think, you know, kind of what you just suggested is very true. People are moving away from manual to where one, you know, it was a punch card every time. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier about, you know, Subway, like yes. I remember back in, in high school going to Subway and at the time, we thought it was the greatest thing ever because you could get a free <laughs> sub. That's right. Uh, and you, I honestly still see the occasional random place uh, I go to now that does have versions of punch cards, uh, and it's a very rudimentary type of loyalty. The next evolution of that was people joining, say, with just a phone number. Yes. But then that still does require the counter person has to say every time, are you in the program? You know, what's your phone number? And we've done a lot of secret shopper studies. There's more often than not, so above half the time, people, counter people, don't ask, are you in the program? And then what's even stranger is when they ask, are you in the program? People say no, and they just carry on with the train. They don't say, do you want to join? They right. don't even ask. There's like a second step there. If you don't do the second step, it, it's you might as well not have even asked, right? Exactly true. So that was like the next evolution. Uh, and then, you know, mobile apps came along. But I wouldn't really even call that an evolution because the problem with the mobile app is I find it extremely annoying when a loyalty program requires a mobile app. Great. Because people have mobile app fatigue. Tell my mom she has to download a mobile app to use a loyalty program she's going to go in once every two months. Like, yeah. she, she won't do that. A, a lot of people won't do that. And then I find what happens, even the ones I do download, when I'm waiting in line, 
I, I try and open it up and like I have to download the new version of it or I have to log in and I'm just trying to buy like a burrito. So <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that was an evolution. And then I would say the next evolution is what we're doing in some other companies where it all happens in a more automated way. The more friction you remove, I think is, is how we're seeing that go. And it's the same with payments online. Yeah. Like I think one of the biggest things we saw, I mean, I've changed my shopping online quite a bit because versus five years ago before the pandemic, now, anytime I see something online, if I'm not buying it on Amazon, I'm usually buying it using like shop.com or I'm using like PayPal. Uh, I mean, almost everything is now connected to something. So it's the whole online shopping is so easy now. It's, 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 it's also the perfect example of like the embedded banking finance that everything is just seamless. Like if, if you want to buy something, you just click a button, your address loads automatically, your information, credit uh, payment card loads it, you know, automatically. Yeah. I mean, it, it's become so much easier. And if, if we've been spoiled by that experience and have tasted it as consumers, it's hard to go back or live in a world oh. where it's like, wait, this is actually going to be, I got to click it. What do people do? I have to do enter they... my whole address, my whole card number. Like yeah. that's, that seems such a pain in the butt now. It becomes an abandonment issue. It does. It's like, wait, I'll actually just watch this socially or whatever it is. If I can't click it and buy it, I'm going to go to Amazon yeah. and do it there. Yeah. And that's often the habit that we've seen. Um, where loyalty meets the future of analytics mm. is something also that's really interesting. I think there is, although we talk about loyalty and knowing your customer and things like that, I believe that without analytics, that becomes a very hard thing to do. Could you talk to us a little bit about the importance of analytics and how that's going to affect the future and how AI ties into those analytics? Right. So those are a couple big questions. Big. Uh, the, on the, and the analytics side, one thing that I always find really fascinating is people we're talking to, they, they want to create a loyalty program. And oftentimes it's because their C-level told them they had to, or their competitor has one, or they yes. just think it's like this, this feel good, like, okay, everyone has a loyalty program, we have to do one. And we always come back and say, listen, like this should be a profit center. This is not a, this is not a cost. Uh, and the way, the way we show it, and, and this is also the word embedded comes in player too. If you're embedded into the payment process and the terminal, the way we do it uh, at V Loyalty, we're able to see all transactions that come through, yeah. members or in non-members. Got it. And that's vital in order to be able to do analytics. So we can see X amount was spent by non-members, and this is the average order size by non-member. X amount was spent by members, and here's the the increase in average order size. And it's it's very common to see an average order size lift of about 40% or so. Um, so we can show exact dollar amount that's created from a loyalty program. And then we can tie it back to the actual ROI. You can look at, okay, here's how much reward. It costs you X amount in rewards. It costs you Y to kind of run the program, the management of it. And we just showed you that you, you've made, you know, an extra $400,000 in sales, but the program only costs you $40,000 to run. So therefore we can show them it's a 10 X ROI. Absolutely. And if, if you, I think your question to the future, if you can show that to the C level, they're going to invest money and want to make that even bigger. Absolutely. Right. So it's, it's all about being able to show that. Yeah. And I think there's this value that today's world that maybe we knew about 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and five years ago of like that ability to actually speak to their habits, speak yes. to their buying patterns, understand what that customer may want. So as we think about kind of the artificial intelligence right. portion of it, how do you see that going over the next three to five years crystal ball? Well, I think it will become much more utilized. I think right now, more than anything else, there's a lot more talk about yes. artificial intelligence where it's gonna do so much and this and that. But I think artificial intelligence will be most used by people with the biggest sets of data, like the banks and people like that. They see buying patterns across everything and they have millions and millions of members. And it's yeah. easier to actually do things with artificial intelligence when you have volumes of data Absolutely. like that. So I think you will start to see the more personalized offers by by day, by by correlation of people who buy this normally buy this. So you yes. will recommend that. Um, there was a really good example I actually heard here from someone. And this is, you know, the general discussion during one of these uh, on stage presentations was, you know, everyone's talking about AI, but lots of people just don't really know what to do with it. I mean, yeah. we all use ChatGPT and like 
have fun with it. And I've, I've tried to write some articles using it and some marketing messaging and Absolutely. everyone does yeah. that. Um, but they were saying like, here's an, here's an example people don't think of. If, okay, so payments, you, you don't really think about customer service much, but customer service is kind of like this, almost like the stepchild of payments. Like you, your people have to be happy that things are working the correct way or else they're not gonna use your service. Absolutely. So it's very much a part of payments, but you don't really think about it. But the example given on stage was, uh, if you have you know, two years of data from customer service questions, copy and paste all of that into AI, let AI combine all those questions into one common set, come up with one common set of answers, and then suddenly you've, you can almost have canned answers for every single thing you've done in two years without having an individual do it. But that's the sort of thing that most people may not think of, but you can solve problems with all different parts of payments. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting time for us. Totally. As we've watched you know, the transition of business over the last couple of decades and payments, some people would have argued, oh, you know, loyalty is gonna look so much different than it did. I think it looks a lot the same, but except for the fact that we're removing clicks and yeah. we're removing the friction part of it. So that embedded concept that you're talking about is so powerful as it relates to what we're seeing here and what everybody is talking about. Anything that you feel is going to be groundbreaking or is going to shift loyalty as we move into the future? Like what are we, or what are we excited about as we look at loyalty from your perspective? Well, this, this kind of stems from our, what, what we do with the automated recognition where people come into the store, use a credit card and they're rec recognized automatically. I think that's gonna extend, and you're seeing this from like some Amazon technology now, when you go even to the Las Vegas airport, yeah. uh, there, there's the one place you can go into where uh, you, you, you put a credit card into the machine uh, and then you can walk around and you can pick anything up off the shelves. There's no cashiers, there's no one there. Everything is essentially, and then you walk right out. You don't pay anyone, no one checks anything. But I think more and more, not only shopping is gonna be like that, but loyalty will be like that. That you, You'll be recognized off, often biometrically. Like it won't have to be Absolutely. by card, but you could be recognized just walking in a store. Facial recognition. Facial recognition, like at yeah. the airports now with TSA. I, mean, I don't know if you've flown much, but. Yeah, digital ID. Yeah, you, I went through customs coming back from, where was that, Mexico, Spain? I think yeah. it was in Spain and literally just walked down an aisle, I have TAC, Global Entry, and I didn't even, no one even talked to me. Amazing. Like literally. Yeah. Just like, it, it was recognized crazy. us yeah. and just walking through. And like, I never stopped walking. Like it was amazing. Yeah. It was, it was so fast and seamless, but I think like th there's no reason all of commerce and loyalty and things are, won't be moving towards, towards that. That is awesome. That is awesome. We said a lot here today. A lot, a lot going on, a lot of activity. We're excited to see how the future is going to unfold. Really excited to actually experience your product as well. I think y'all have nailed it from the perspective of removing those clicks, removing the questions at the counter for a you know, customer service rep or somebody working in fast food or at a dry cleaners or whatever it is. Like, How do we get that loyalty in without having to have all these steps of training? I think it's really cool to see Love the biometric concept as well. <laughs> Thanks for joining that's, us today. That's coming. It's yeah. coming. I know. Yeah. I think. I think. By the way, that is the next. I you nail. I, when you said biometric, by the way, I was like, we're watching those little pieces happen yeah. and what the future is going to look like. And the airlines are leading that type charge, but we're also seeing it at you know Whole Foods when you just have to use kind of a palm to pay. Now. Yeah, yeah. That loyalty would also be connected to that. We're really experiencing that type of thing of the app world shifting away. So. Totally. Cool to see what y'all are doing. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. If you want to learn about all things ETA and all of the interviews that we have hosted, please watch the podcast Embedded on Spotify, Apple. You can also find us on YouTube and all the social channels.